Hear the sound of heaven Like the sound of many waters It's the sound of worship Coming from the throne There are cries of adoration As men from every nation Lift their voice to make his glory known Singing, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. The angels and angels bow, the redeemed. Worship you now, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Can you hear the sound of heaven like the sound of many waters? It's the sound of worship coming from the throne there are cries of adoration as men from every nation live their voice to make his glory known singing holy Holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Jesus is holy. The angels bow. The redeemed, redeemed worship you now. Holy are you, Lord. You are holy. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Jesus is holy, the, the redeemed, worship you now, holy, 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 are you?
get to see him and say those words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. Please join me in prayer. Father, we love you. And we thank you for this day and this time that we have to gather together and to worship you, Lord. Uh, Father, it's been a, a wonderful, wonderful morning already. And I say that because we're here and you are present with us as well. And we're blessed to be here. And anyone who has walked into this facility and anyone who is joining us online, they are truly blessed. Regardless of the circumstance that they may be in, regardless of whatever trial they may be facing, Lord, they truly are blessed. And I pray, Father, as we continue through this day, that we continue in this time of worship, that we freely worship you, that we do so lovingly, openly, without restraint, Father. And as we get into your word, Father, may your word speak to our hearts, Lord, and move us. Holy Spirit, move in this place in the only way that you can. And we will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It is so good to see each of you. What a beautiful day the Lord has given to us. It's a little chilly this morning, but it is a great day. And if today happens to be your first day at Mount Lebanon, welcome. We're glad you made a choice to be here, whether in person or online. And if you would, please just take a moment to fill out one of our visitor cards. It is in the pew. You can just put down your name and address. Um, it just gives us, again, an opportunity to reach back out to you and say thank you for making that choice to be here. Just a few announcements, um, a few that are not actually in the bulletin that I want to make you aware of. One, next Sunday um, is our yearly Basketball Recognition Sunday. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to recognize the players and the coaches um, and to be able to uh, talk a little bit about the season so the committee will be uh, present that day and we'll be speaking uh, here and again recognizing and honoring that time that we've had it has been a very good season uh, two other things on the sign up uh, sheet uh, on the bullet in the, excuse me on the bulletin over by the office um, is volleyball signups co-ed that deadline is next Sunday we have to know that at 12 o'clock we'll take that list and we will go and uh, submit the registration and then we also have uh, softball signups, and that deadline will be March the 10th. And if you will open your bulletin, I'm going to share a couple of things with you. One, there is a little bit of a typo uh, for student life. It says Friday, February 18th. Well, today's February 18th, and it's Sunday. We're having our student life discipleship. So students, remember tonight from 5 to 6.30, we will be over in the ministry house uh, for our discipleship time. Also, we will be going to Winter Jam this week. We've had uh, quite a few that have signed up. We will be leaving uh, the church somewhere around 4.15. Uh, the deadline for that sign-up is Wednesday the 21st. Do not uh, forget that. Ladies' Ministry, Sunday, February 24th, um, a lunch at 12 o'clock at the Atlanta Bread Company. There are other opportunities for the ladies' ministry, as you will see there. Also, for the men, a couple of announcements. April 5th, 6th, and 7th, there's a men's spring retreat um, at Charleston. The cost is $100. Deadline to sign up is March 3rd. And then this is later in the year, but just so that you know, uh, February, excuse me, September 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Four days, Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, to see the play uh, Daniel. And there is going to be a meeting for anyone interested in this trip this Wednesday after the service. Um, and before I ask you all to stand, I, I think Ted may may have an announcement. Do you do you have an announcement, Ted? There's a beautiful. We interrupt these announcements to make an announcement. <laughs> uh, we are uh, uh, proud to announce that uh, baby boy, now named Stewart, not named un until they left the hospital, but he has a name now, Bennett Gray Stewart. And Christy are doing fine. Bennett weighed in on the scales, tipping them at 7 pounds and 14 ounces. And he measured standing tall at 20 inches. <laughs> yeah. All is the way. Yes. Congratulations to you two and to the family. Okay, church family, this is our time to greet one another. If you will, please stand and reach out a hand of fellowship. Welcome. 
one another, say hello, greet one another, welcome, we're glad you made it here.
I've never got over that I am not under the bondage of sin anymore. I'm still amazed that Jesus would pay a debt I could not afford. I've never got past that I'm free at last from the sin that made me a slave. And I still feel as much as when he first touched me. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. And I'm still in all that he gave it all for an old sinner. shoulder my sin and all its disgrace Calvary still still gives me a thrill oh yes I'm still amazed I'm amazed this stranger would accept a manger in trade for a kingly throne and I'm still at a loss why he take the cross instead of streets of pure gold he's the only king who gave everything in exchange for a cold dark grave and i'd still love to ponder this god-given wonder oh yes i'm still amazed i'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. And I'm still in all that he gave it all for an old sinner like me. I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin and all its disgrace. Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill, oh yes, I'm still amazed, I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin and all its disgrace, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. go to set a lost man free and I'm still in all that he gave it all for an old sinner like me I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin and all its disgrace Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill I'm still amazed I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin and all this disgrace Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill Oh yes I'm still amazed Amen. It is a pleasure and a joy and a thrill, like that song talked about, to be able to be here and worship this morning. And I hope we don't ever get over that. I hope we don't ever get over what Christ did for us and the privilege and opportunity we have to be able to worship and gather together every Sunday and Wednesday. And I thank you for being faithful to be here. 
Um, I, w- I do want to give you a heads up. We've got some special services planned leading up to Easter uh, in the month of March. And you'll hear more details about these as we make, get the, the plans uh, set in place. Uh, but you'll hear more this week and next Sunday about what these services will be like. But, but put it on your calendar and make sure you're able, you, that, that you attend and are present for these services. It's going to be, a, you know, Easter is early this year. It's March the 31st. And we've got some really special things coming up leading up to that. So uh, put that on your calendar. Well, Valentine's Day came and gone. I hope everybody took advantage of it. If you didn't, it's not too late. Better late than never. But um, as I mentioned last week, I had a the sermon that I had reminded and picked out. I knew I wouldn't get through it last week, so this is kind of part two of of, of that sermon titled, True Love Ways. So just to see if you remember, who sang the song, True Love Ways? Buddy Holly. Thank you. Somebody was listening last week. Well, here's the next trivia. Another group did the same song in the 1960s. It was a duet, two, two men. Who was that? Peter and Gordon. You remember Peter and Gordon? They sang the little song, uh, um, what was the other song they sang? I Go, I Go to Pieces or something like that? Well, they sang this song too. So you never know what you'll learn when you come here to hear a sermon. And it had nothing to do with Johnny Cash. Because as far as I know, he never sang that song. Well, last week we talked about true love ways, the ways of love. Uh, and it, when I, it was based on 1 John chapter 4. We talked about love's foundation, which is God. God is the beginning and the end of love. He is love. The middle part between the bookends of love of God is the ground that we must work. It's our place where we have to do the work of love uh, in our life. It's, it's to be worked out. It has to be maintained. And we talked about that last week. If you're lazy in love, you'll be a loser in love because it requires maintenance for love to be able to continue to grow in our life, which is what is God's will. We talked about the fundamentals of love being commitment. That commitment must be there from the beginning. It's the anvil of love. and Everything that beats against love to try to destroy it will be destroyed when we have the commitment based upon our Lord Jesus Christ. And the other uh, fundamental of love is forgiveness. And forgiveness that just keeps, keeps on giving and setting things straight that needs to be straight before they can fester. It protects the environment of the garden of our love, and we must maintain that. Forgiveness keeps away the predators that would come in and destroy our garden of love that we are to maintain as we love like God loves. So today, we're going to finish this up by talking about what I call the faces of love. What does love look like? What are some things that we we should, people should see in us to recognize our love and that we should demonstrate to the world as we love? It's an, an exhaustive study. You can't get to the end of this. I mean, it could go on and on so there's, because there's many ways that we can, distrip, can demonstrate our love, but I want to look at just a few of them today, and I believe these are critical in, in our life as we go about doing what God said to do. Um, you know, we were told by John that in 1 John 4, we are to love one another. And so today we're going to begin by looking at <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth, and he said, For the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ is the, is the thing that motivates us and should be our inspiration of, of love to, because we judged us that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Christ is the reason that we are to love one another. 
He is love. He, he, he demonstrated his love. He, he showed us his love by dying on the cross for us. And that is our motivation. We never have an excuse to not love because God so loved the world. He did what he did because he loved and, and he is our example in love. So when we're born again, born into the kingdom of God, God placed his son, Jesus Christ, in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he helps us to know how to function in the image of Christ. That's God's expectation. The Holy Spirit is our enabler to help us to do that. Romans chapter 8 talks about that. To help us to know how to live the way we should live in Christ. So the Holy Spirit is working in our life to help us be who we ought to be and live the way we ought to live and love the way we ought to love. Now the Holy Spirit is working to produce fruit in our life, the fruit of love. Jesus Christ said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branch. If any man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. So it's the work of the Holy Spirit to guide us into understanding what true love would look like. And of course, I'm referring to the scripture over in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit, things that should show up in our life as we walk in the Spirit. I'm going to read these. I didn't ask Pam to put these up on the screen, but let me read some of them, but I'm not going to go through this whole list. There's about two or three of them I want us to talk about this morning in, the, in true love ways. Paul writes in verse 22 of Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is first love. Isn't that amazing? The first thing that he talks about is love. <clears throat> Excuse me. Love is an attitude. Love is an action. And love is the result when we walk in Christ. That great chapter on love, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes, Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and I don't have love, I'm nothing. Though I have a faith to move a mountain and I don't have love, I'm nothing. He goes on to say, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And he goes on to say, there abides these three, faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. There abides hope, the hope of glory. But he said, but the greatest of these is love. The expectation of God is that we love. And what he's telling us, if love isn't present, then nothing else really matters. So the first fruit that should be seen in the life of every Christian is the fruit of love. It's not optional. It's an expectation of God that we are to love one another. Period. But there's other fruits in here that, that flow out of that. And one of those fruits that I, I like is that second one that he talks about there, the fruit of joy. You know, Jesus valued joy. On the night before he was crucified, he, he, he spoke to his disciples and he said, I'll tell you these things that your joy may be full. Now, he was facing death and he was talking about joy. In John 17, he prayed to the Father for them and for us. To, Father, give them my joy. He greatly valued joy in the life of, of believers. You know, in the story of in, in Luke, when Mary visited Elizabeth after Mary found out that she would be the mother of the, of the Christ, she went to see Elizabeth who had a child in her womb, John. And the Bible says that when, when Mary walked into the room where Elizabeth was, that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt with joy over the very presence of Mary coming into that room with her baby. In the book of Nehemiah, as they came to rebuild the temple wall, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
Other places in the Bible, it talks about a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. And even in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he repeats what Christ said, that your joy may be complete. John says, I'm writing these things about love so that your joy can be complete. So we need to have, as Christians, <clears throat> ways to express our joy in all that we do, no matter what the circumstances are. And one of the best ways to do that is laughter. Laughter. We need to be happy people and laugh more. I came in this morning to the church and I met somebody in the, coming down the aisle with a little child. And the child was just having a belly laugh, just laughing. And I thought, well, that's probably the most pleasing sound God will hear this morning at Mount Lebanon, is the laughter of a child. We need to fill our life with laughter. We need more laughter. Except Ted. Ted, Ted already has the minimum required daily allowance of laughter. <clears throat> you can't be around Ted long, and he'll be laughing, and you'll be laughing. And that's good. Some, some notable quotes about laughter. Somebody asked Reba McIntyre one time what her philosophy in life was. She said, all I need is a wishbone, a backbone, and a funny bone. And the most important of those, she said, is the funny bone. The importance of being joyful. Victor Borg, you know who he is piano player and, and a com comedian, he said the shortest distance between two people is laughter. If anything, no matter what's going on, if you can laugh together, then you'll be drawn closer together. Jerry Clower said that the only place in the universe where there's not laughter is hell. Laughter is a good medicine. And we need to have more joy in our life, in our, in our love life with with our spouses and our children and our friends and the body of Christ, there's, there's so much bad things in the world that cause us to fret. We need to show joy and laughter as a face of love. People need to see us as joyous people. And if you're like me and you can't find anything to laugh at, go look in the mirror. <laughs> that always brings a big chuckle out of me. <clears throat> Well, there's another fruit in here. Paul talks about uh, when he writes this letter, and it is a fruit of kindness. The fruit of kindness. The world's becoming more and more hateful. Have you noticed that? Just a lot of animosity in the world and hatefulness. And this is an indictment against Christians. We, we don't need to be that way. We need to love like Christ did. He was never hateful. He was stern sometimes, but not hateful. We, all, we need to always be kind. Our children need to experience kindness always at home. You know, families and homes and marriages are under attack, and there's a lot of pressure. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll let our words and our attitudes be less kind than they should be. And the Bible says if we are walking in the light with Jesus Christ as we should be, we, this, the fruit of kindness will always be present in our life. There's never a time when we shouldn't be kind. And if our children don't see kindness on display in the home, where else are they going to learn it? We need to learn how to respond no matter what the situation is with kindness. And there's examples throughout the Bible of how to live kind. Just be kind. If you go in the, in the door at the building of the Greer Christian Learning Center in the, on the Greer campus, and you walk in the, the door where the high school classes meet, there's a little note that's stuck on the, on the door that says this, be kind or leave. Be kind or leave. And maybe we need to live by that. There never needs to be a time when we can't be kind. It doesn't matter what the other person is saying or doing to us, we need to respond with kindness. And you know what? That throws people off balance. When they expect you to retaliate with a, with a remark and you re retaliate with a kind word. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer 
turns away wrath. We need to live by that. Ephesians chapter 4, and I mentioned this last week, talking about forgiveness, but in the same verse, Ephesians 4, 32, says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Kindness. Now, I was studying for this message, and another words to another song came to my mind. Imagine that. And it's not Johnny Cash. If you see your brother standing by the road with a heavy load from the seeds he sowed, and if you, stop, and if you see your sister falling by the way, just stop and say, you're going the wrong way. You've got to try a little kindness. Show a little kindness. Shine your light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, and you'll overlook the blindness of the narrow-minded people on the narrow-minded street. Don't walk around the town. Don't walk around down and out. Lend a helping hand instead of doubt. And the kindness that you show every day will help someone along their way. You've got to try a little kindness. Yes, show a little kindness. Shine your light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, and you'll overlook the blindness of the narrow-minded people on the narrow-minded street. Glenn Campbell. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, what does that tell us? We're to let our light shine. When Christ talked about you're the light of the world and you're to let your light so shine before men that they should see your good works and glorify the Father, kindness is one way to do that. No matter what, be kind. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Now, a lot of times we can't do that on our own. I can't. And I have been chastised severely by the Holy Spirit at times when I did not respond in a kind way. And later on, the Holy Spirit got me aside and said, who do you think you are? So kindness is a very important fruit of the true love ways. But there's another one in here. And I'm kind of glad my wife's not with me today because she would probably raise her hand and say, can I testify about that one? <laughs> that one? It's the fruit of patience. The fruit of patience. That's a way to demonstrate the true ways of love. It's when we are patient. He says in, in the fruit of the Spirit, he calls it long-suffering. When we are patient, it leads to encouragement of other people. When we suffer long and we endure, and now all of us need encouragement. All of us need people to be patient with us. And we all need to be patient people. And so we are reminded by Paul here to show patience. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, it says this, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all people. It's another expectation that God has of us as Christians. Be patient. I'm amazed. I watch or read through the Bible how Christ dealt with those apostles, and he was patient. They, they just didn't get it sometimes. And he, but he was patient with them and encouraged them, and they kept growing in their faith and growing in their love, and, and it requires that. Do you have a problem with patience? I do pretty good until I get behind the wheel of the car, and then I have to work on it. But one of the mo moments that God really teaches me is with me and Drenda, and one of the things that I have to really work on patience is when we get ready to go somewhere, and we're ready to go, and I say, are you ready to go? And she says, yes. And I go, so I'll go to get the car out. But she's not ready to go. She's ready. She's never late. Brenda's never late. She's ne I've never had to wait on her to get ready. It's getting her out of the house is the problem. And she inherited that from her mother. And, and so I sit there, and it's like, okay. You know, I, you, were, you were headed towards the door when I went out the door. What happened? 
But as I sat and I think about that, the Lord convicted me strongly about what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. And so I just sit and pray, and I thank God for my wife, and thankful that she loves her home, and has her touch on everything in that house, and she wants it to be in order. And I think what she's doing is going through the house, maybe giving thanks to God too. And it just takes her a little while to get out the door. So God taught me when I'm not being patient, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. You see, the world's watching us as Christians. And we claim to be Christians, and we claim the love of God, and we talk about the love of God. But Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by the way you love. And these are some of the ways that we can practically show true love ways. To be joyous, and be kind, and be patient. Paul writing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And these are words I think we need to take to heart as, I, as we c- conclude our thoughts on this. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And what is he saying there? He's saying, you don't need more instruction about this. You don't need more reminding about this. God's already told you, and he's placed his spirit in you. He demonstrated his love for you, that he sent his son to die for you. Now, the only thing that's left now is to love one another. It's a choice. So Paul said, we don't need to write to you or instruct you any further for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. You have his spirit in you who is the one who guides us into all truth. And then in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, the same letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he, God, may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. We sang those wonderful songs today, Holy, Holy, Holy. God is holy. And when he comes, he's going to look at how we loved one another. If you want to worship God and recognize his holiness, the best way to do that is to love one another. And that's what God is telling us here. God's going to examine our love for one another. Whether you're talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ, your friends, especially in the home, your children, and your spouse. Love one another. And by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, he said. The world needs to see it. We don't need to just talk about it. We don't need to just read about it and sing about it. We need to be kind and joyful. We need to be patient and demonstrate what the love of God really is. So this morning, we need to examine our garden of love, the, the, the garden plot that you've been given to maintain of love and ask ourselves the question are there any weeds in it you know how it is in any garden if you don't maintain it and you don't work on it the weeds will take over something about them you can fertilize plants and they barely will grow but you can leave weeds out there in the hot sun no water and they just prosper they just go crazy well that's what happens in our love life if we don't maintain it and take care of it we need to have the commitment and the forgiveness that's there Um, these are the weed killers, the things that keeps the weeds down when we commit and and forgive one another. You remember a few months ago, I preached a sermon about little foxes. 
that can creep in through the hedges and destroy the vineyard. When we have a commitment to God and his ways and a commitment to one another, and when we forgive one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us, that keeps the little foxes out. It runs them off. But the love and the joy and the kindness and the patience and the other fruits of the Spirit that we talked about, they're the things that just fertilize the growth of love and makes it get stronger and stronger. It builds strong roots that are not easily withered. It produces fruit that is abundant and sweet. And when we do that, other people, especially our children, will be blessed and deeply rooted in love. And that's what the world needs. It needs to see it in our marriages, in our homes. It needs to see it in our churches. It needs to see it in our lives as we go out into the world and let our light shine. So this morning, my challenge to myself and to you too is to look in your spiritual mirror. Are you doing the work of love in your life? It requires daily attention every single day to stand before the Lord and let him instruct you and me on what we need to be doing better. Love, above all, love. The greatest of these, Paul said, is love. And when that's not what it ought to be, the other things will, will suffer. Love. So today, maybe while we're standing in this place before the Lord, we need to address anything that God puts on our mind, or maybe even better yet, if God puts something on your heart that you need to, to deal with, maybe you need to kneel before the Lord and confess it, repent of it. Love one another. And this is how they'll know you're my disciples. Let's pray. Lord, we sang about it this morning, your holiness. We sang about not being able to get over how great your love is. And Lord, we know that we'll never completely understand it. How you could love sinful people like us enough to die for us. But Lord, we thank you for the enabling power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to be able to love people. And even our own selves. Sometimes, Lord, we have trouble loving our own selves. And we can't not love ourselves because you love us. So, Lord, this morning we just talked just the tip of the garment of what love really should look like. So, Lord, today I pray that if there's somebody in our presence here or someone listening and watching online that have not experienced your love, Lord, I just pray that today they wouldn't understand what love really is through you. Lord, help us all to understand that we can't love like we ought to if we have a problem in our relationship with you. So, Lord, if there's anybody that needs to come down to, Lord, to receive your love and forgiveness of sin and be born into the kingdom of God, I pray that today would be that day. And, Lord, for those of us who have been, Lord, I realize I fall short. And you allow us to repent and confess that so that we can be restored and, and strengthened, Lord, as we go out into the world and to show them true love ways. So, Lord, I thank you for the, your love. I thank you for the theme of Scripture that talks about your love. Help us, Lord, to be pleasing in your eyes when it comes to the subject of love. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible patience with us. I thank you for your kindness, Lord, in the way that you gently deal with us in our, our sin. I thank you, Lord, for the reason we have to have joy. And I thank you, Lord, that the world can't take that away. No matter what happens in this world, you have instilled joy in us. And, Lord, we need to put it on a pedestal and let it flow out of our hearts and our minds and other people be impacted by the overflow of our joy of the fact of knowing that our sins are forgiven, our names are written in heaven, and there's nothing I can do to lose it. So, Lord, thank you for that. I have to pray that you'll have your will and your way in our life. 
your will and your way in everyone in this congregation this morning. Whatever needs to be done, I pray will be done. And we pray it in the holy and righteous name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you stand, please? see Christ only always living in me. That should be the desire of our heart. That's what we're talking about today. The way the world knows Christ is what they see in our life and what they need to see is the, the true love ways being played out. I thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for your, for your faithfulness and being here week after week. And I remind you that this week we've got a lot of opportunities. Chris has mentioned some of them already Wednesday night. Uh, be here if you can and be, be part of it. It's good to see Brother Jim Sizemore back with us after his procedure just this week. And here he came in today, said he felt like he could run. I told him to go ahead and I'd watch him <laughs> and with timing. So, but uh, it's good to have you here. Thank you for your faithfulness and, and pray for one another. Pray for one another and above all, love one another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, it's always true. It never fails. Thank you for your spirit that guides us into all truth in the word. Help us not to be discouraged but encouraged. Help us, Lord, to remember the power, Lord, of forgiveness and, and repentance and that puts Satan on the run. So, Lord, I thank you for your people here at Mount Lebanon, and I pray, Lord, that your holy will would be done in our lives and in and through our church this week. And we pray it in the holy and righteous name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah.